Um, so uh, before I get started, kind of going through those topics that you guys have mentioned in the chat box, um, just a couple of reminders, refreshers about the test. Um, so you want to bring your school Chromebook. That's your absolute 100% first choice um, charged so that you can um, take the test on your particularly assigned day. Um, because the test will be in a AP Classroom with Lockdown Browser that is already um, uploaded as an app on your school Chromebook, easiest way to go. Um, for any reason, if you bring your own non-Chromebook, your, your personal uh, laptop that is not a personal Chromebook, um, you should download Lockdown Browser and install it before you come to class. Um, but again, the school Chromebook is the absolute um, best option. Easiest, no additional prep work for you. Um, the test will be 80 minutes. You'll have the entire class period to take it. Um, and it will uh, begin exactly at 9.20. Um, so 9.20, you're in class, you're in your seat, you can open your thing and get started. Uh, there will be no additional time given unless you have um, a late, late bus. So if you're a car rider and you just got dropped off late, you're gonna have to take it with what time is left. Um, it'll be 35 multiple choice questions, uh, two free response questions, very similar to the ones that you've seen um, in AP Classroom. Um, in terms of the practice ones that you've seen, same format, everything like that. Um, and then also that carbon nitrogen diagram that you guys have worked with um, a couple times before. You will need um, a calculator for any potential math questions that you may see. You cannot use the calculator on your phone um, and you won't have access to the one on your laptop because you'll be in lockdown browser. Um, so make sure that you bring um, a calculator, a simple four function calculator is fine that can add, subtract, multiply and divide but you are able to answer and solve any and all of these problems without the use of a calculator. They're that simplistic. Um, remember you're looking at uh, potential unit conversions and also working with exponents. Um, is there anything else? Uh, one thing to mention with the FRQs, um, make sure that when you answer them, so some of them may have, so here's question A, answer it. Question B may have separate parts. You do not want to answer each part all in one paragraph. You want to separate the answers out individually um, and you want to answer them briefly. Okay, complete sentences unless you're being asked to identify something um, like you were in those um, food web uh, questions. You could literally just identify, you know, tertiary consumer so forth and so on. You do not have to restate the question in your answer. Um, there's no real need for an introductory paragraph or an introductory sentence. You can go straight into answering that question. Um, and also make sure that you are, number one, answering the question that is asked, not the question you think is being asked. Um, so don't read too much into it. And number two, that you are answering and providing the same amount of responses that the question is asking for. So if the question asks for two responses and you give three and the first one is wrong and the second one and third one are right, they're only gonna read, and I'm only gonna read the first two. So if you're asked for one and you give two and the first one is wrong, I'm not gonna give credit for that second, okay? So make sure that you're only giving the number of responses that are being asked for. Um, okay, so that is all that jazz, reminders for the test, things to keep in mind. Let's start looking at some of these uh, questions you guys have asked. Um, so one of the first things that I saw was somebody asked um, about going over thermodynamics. Okay, um, so thermodynamics, you learned about these, you may not have seen them in the video under this name. Same things that you've learned about, different uh, formal physics-based name for these. Um, so just kind of prepping, breaking this word down. So the suffix IC means process. 
specifically process of. Dynamos means movement. And thermo is heat. In this case, when we're talking about heat, we're talking about energy. So thermodynamics is literally the understanding of the process of the movement of heat. In this case, the heat in the form of energy. So the process of movement of energy, okay? So for thermodynamics, there are two major concepts that you have to be familiar with. Um, and you've seen both of them, you just haven't seen them identified as laws. So the first law of thermodynamics um, basically governs energy creation and destruction. So energy is not created or not destroyed. So the energy that we have is the same energy that we're always gonna have. All it can do is change forms. Okay, so for example, we may have chemical energy that we convert to kinetic energy that then gets converted into electrical energy to turn something into potential energy. Okay, the energy here is the same energy that we get down here. Okay, all it's done is change its form. Okay. So this is called the law of conservation of energy. We are conserving the amount of energy in a particular um, system is how we would refer to it. Okay. So first law, energy can't be created or destroyed. What we start with is what we're gonna end with. The second law of thermodynamics deals with these conversions, okay? And it says that no energy conversion is 100% efficient, okay? So every time we convert energy from one form to another, we are going to lose energy, okay? So energy that is lost is energy that is turned into an unusable form, okay? So when you hear me say, what happened to the energy that was lost? What I'm asking you is what happened to the energy that was changed into a form that cannot be used now, okay? And that energy that is lost, that is turned into unusable form, may also be referred to as being turned into low quality energy. All that is just trying to say heat, okay? So, lost energy is just energy that has been converted to heat that we now can't use. And you have looked at this already. You've seen that the rule of thumb in an ecosystem, for example, is the 10% rule, right? So every time in an ecosystem, energy is transferred up the food chain, only 10% of it is gonna be moved up to that next step, okay? Because we're looking at this energy is being used for cellular respiration. It's being used for, for example, like DNA, um, RNA, protein synthesis. It's being used to build biomass. So that energy is being used for a lot of things. It's the energy that goes into the biomass that is what gets transferred because we're eating the biomass, right? So we have this trophic pyramid and we have all these levels, right? So theoretically, the organisms that are on the bottom, which are your primary producers, are going to have access to and use 
100% of the energy that they get from the sun, okay? Talking theoretic numbers here. Remember, this is kind of a rule of thumb for the mass conversion. Um, so you have these primary consumers who are um, exclusively herbivores. They're only going to eat this producer. They are only going to get 10% of that energy from the biomass that they eat compared to the total amount that these producers had access to. Right? Then you have this secondary consumer, which could be an omnivore or it could be a carnivore. Okay. Um, so let's say as a carnivore, it eats this herbivore. Now it only has 1% of the original energy. Okay. If it is acting in its capacity as an omnivore, maybe it's eating the producer. In that case, if it's eating the producer, this would actually become a primary consumer because it's eating this primary base here. And it will get 10% of the energy in the primary producer because it's eating directly from this lowest level of the trophic pyramid. The secondary consumer may be eaten by a tertiary consumer. This is almost exclusively carnivores. That transfer is going to be less than 1%, so 0.1% of the starting energy. We can look at the other side and see that this omnivore is being eaten by this carnivore. So this carnivore now functions as a secondary consumer. And it's going to get 1% of the overall energy. Okay. So when you're looking at that process, make sure that you're looking at what is eating what um, to be able to identify primary, secondary, tertiary consumers and um, of the like. We also know that this rule is the reason why these trophic pyramids, these ecosystems, typically only have three to four consumer levels in them. Because there's so little energy at the top, these organisms have to eat more prey in order to meet their basic energy needs. This is why the majority of tertiary quaternary consumers, these apex predators, um, tend to be small in body compared to their prey. Um, exceptions, you know, you think of bears, bears are um, omnivores, they're more secondary consumers, but they can serve in some ecosystems as one of the higher level predators. Um, but typically tertiary, quaternary consumers are very small in body because they have to eat so much to maintain their energy. Um, so lions may be an apex predator, but you're probably not going to find 15 lions in the same hunting territory. You're probably only going to find three to four because they have to eat so much. Okay. Um, so that is uh, thermodynamics and a little bit beyond um, because understanding thermodynamics is really something that you have to understand to understand this. Um, Any questions about that? Any additional clarification needed? To Thomas, did this answer the questions that you had about yeah. thermodynamics? Yes, it did. Oh, awesome. um, but for some ecosystems, could they only have like uh, one or two levels of the pyramid or do, does everyone have all um, four? Um, it is entirely going to depend on the resources available in the ecosystem. Um, typically, you're going to have at least a primary producer and up to two levels of consumers. Um, that three, four level is going to depend on the resources that are available to make these secondary, tertiary, uh, primary and secondary consumers. Um, so unfortunately, in apes, the answer a lot of times is it depends. Um, 
And in this case, that's one of it. It depends on the resources available in the ecosystem. But you're never going to have more than three to four levels. That's going to be very, very rare. All right. Um, so let's take a look. One of the other uh, concepts that was asked about was um, organism interactions. Okay. So when we talk about organism interactions, what we're talking about are the ways in which two or more organisms um, engage with each other when they are in the same ecosystem. Okay, so we're looking at organisms that are in close contact with each other and share or have access to the same um, biotic and abiotic resources. Okay, so organism interactions are another one of those things that are really reliant upon, sorry, I can't uh, spell today, on resources. Okay, because those resources are going to play a big role in population size and population size plays a large role in these ecosystem interactions. Okay, um, so first of all, uh, I want to kind of give you a heads up on something that the AP exam does that I do not like, but it's the way it is, so we gotta work with it. So when the AP exam just gives you the term symbiosis, um, it's typically meaning that in the form of mutualism, okay? Based on the strict biological definition, Symbiosis is just when two organisms live in close contact with each other in some relationship. The AP exam uses symbiosis and mutualism as the same term. So just keep that in mind if you see that in any, in any questions. All right, so there are um, five major organism interactions that you should be familiar with. So let's talk through those um, briefly, okay? So let's start with the one that we've already identified. So mutualism. Mutualism, as its name suggests, is where both organisms benefit from the interaction, okay? So organism one receives a benefit, organism two receives a benefit. Um, example of this is E. coli in humans, okay? So the human body provides a habitat for the E. coli. What we eat also provides them with nutrients, but the E. coli serves us as helping to keep bad bacteria in check, as well as decomposing some things that we can't. For example, like when we eat uh, plant matter, the E. coli is actually what does the digestion of the cell wall and releases nutrients for us to use. Um, so we are mutually benefited by this interaction, okay? Another one that we have is parasitism, okay? So parasitism occurs when one organism lives on or in, excuse me, lives on or in another organism and uses it for resources without providing anything to the other organism. Um, so the parasite receives a positive interaction, positive uh, component of this. The host is harmed by this, okay? So for example, um, we're talking here ticks on dogs. We're talking um, uh, tapeworms. We're talking, you could even uh, talk about kudzu in a form of having a parasitic relationship um, with some of the plants that it grows on. Um, that one, hold that one in your back pocket because we're gonna address that one um, in the next unit, okay? Um, so we have mutualism, we have parasitism. We may also have predation. Okay, this is where we have this predator-prey relationship. 
where one organism will hunt and feed on another. The predator is benefited by that. The prey is not benefited by that. Okay, so that's where we have, you know, that lion and gazelle interaction, right? Okay. Then we have commensalism. So commensalism occurs when one organism is benefit or yeah, is benefited by the interaction and the other one is not affected in any significant way. Okay. So for example, this would be um, a cow that's walking through grass. And as they walk through the grass, they um, kick up these insects and there are birds that follow behind and eat those insects. So the birds, sorry, I'm something got in my way and I can't move it, there we go. So the birds are positively um, affected by this interaction. They get food with very little effort. The cow could care less about the birds. It's not providing any service to the cows, but it's not hurting the cows either. All right, and lastly, we have competition, okay? So competition is detrimental to both organisms that are, that are in there and because they have to expend resources to either get rid of their competitor or find a way to get to the food first, okay? And there are two major types of competition, okay? There is intraspecific competition, meaning between members of the same species. So for example, this is between two lions trying to get um, the same uh, food source. And then we have interspecific competition, okay? Interspecific is between two separate species. Um, so for example, this may be a lion and a cheetah trying to get access to the same food source, okay? So these are your basic organism interactions that you're gonna see and that you're gonna deal with. Um, let's take kind of a deeper look at competition. So we know there are these two different types of competition, intraspecific and interspecific. Competition also leads us to two separate ideas. Um, and this is one of the reasons why competition is basically a lose-lose situation for anything and everything going through competition. Um, the first thing is the competitive process is going to lead to these two organisms um, having to outdo each other in terms of developing um, new adaptive characteristics to get to the food faster. So um, they may become better hunters, they may uh, be able to run faster, they may have better camouflage so they can find the predator, or sorry, find the prey. Um, so that competition could lead to what is called um, competitive exclusion. Okay, so when you have competitive exclusion, and this one is usually associated with interspecific competition, the two species that are competing or the two organisms that are competing, one of them eventually wins out and pushes the other one completely out of the ecosystem. Um, this is where we say it has won the competitive race. It has taken over that particular ecosystem. So one of the organisms or species in that competitive interaction uh, pushes the other one out. The other thing that could happen in competition um, is what we know as resource partitioning. And what happens here is in some way, shape or form, the resources get um, separated or divided between the various competitors. Um, this one tends to be more associated with intraspecific, 
um, but it has been seen in interspecific as well. Um, so resource partitioning could, for example, happen um, between hawks and owls, okay? Um, the partitioning is that they hunt at different times of the day. Hawks are um, diurnal, active during the day. Owls are nocturnal, active during the night. They eat the same thing, but because they eat at separate times, they've lessened the competitive interactions between the two of them. Um, and I know that you know this, but I just wanna say it. The organisms don't actively say, okay, well, you're gonna eat this and I'm gonna eat this and I'm only gonna come out at four, you're gonna come out at midnight. It's the result of long time, long term um, coevolution and adaptation that leads to that um, occurring. Okay. When it comes to organism interactions, are there any other questions? Did I miss anything? Um, Nathan, did this answer your questions? I just wanted to make sure that my notes were um, uh, consistent with what I needed to know because I know that I uh, didn't do well on the quiz. Okay. It did help. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Um, so the next thing that I was asked to go over is um, your nitrogen cycle. Okay. Um, so you already know that you're going to get that same uh, diagram that you've seen twice already. Um, you're going to be answering the same questions on those particular things. Um, but there are questions on the multiple choice, potentially in the FRQ, that ask you other things about the nitrogen cycle. Um, so it is important that you know not only the steps, but also the um, chemical components um, and all of those different pieces. So we're gonna we're gonna talk our way through this one. Okay. Um, and remember when we draw this, the one that I draw for you is is one that is a land-based nitrogen cycle. Um, but the process of assimilation in terms of getting into algae and things like that, it's the same thing. 99% um, of the time, questions about just the nitrogen cycle in general have to do with the land-based nitrogen cycle. So um, just keep that one in mind. All right, so we're gonna start with atmospheric nitrogen and that comes in the form of N2, so diatomic nitrogen gas. And that is going to be taken out of the atmosphere. And I'm gonna draw our, this is our land here. It's going to be taken out of the atmosphere through the process of nitrogen fixation. Okay. If you're asked what does it, nitrogen fixing bacteria. Okay. So diatomic nitrogen is immediately converted through nitrogen fixation into what component, what compound? turn into ammonia, okay? Remember, ammonia is NH3. The next step is ammonification, okay? And this is done by ammonifying bacteria. They take ammonia and turn it into ammonium, which is NH4+. Plus. Okay, the next step that occurs is a two-step process that converts ammonium into nitrites, NO2 negative, and then into nitrate, NO3 negative. This two-step process is nitrification, done by nitrifying bacteria. At this point, the nitrate can take two pathways. 
it could complete the cycle and be converted back into diatomic nitrogen through the process of denitrification done by denitrifying bacteria. Or it can be taken up by plants in the process called assimilation. to be used um, for whatever the particular plant needs for at that time. Plants are then consumed by animals and that is how animals get access to their nitrogen. Those plants and those animals are going to die. They're gonna go through the decomposition process which will put uh, nitrogen back in Forgot how to spell decomp. Just gonna be that way. Um, put nitrogen in some form back into this process, depending on what's doing the decomposing, either through uh, into ammonia or into ammonium. If you draw it into the ammonification, not gonna be a problem. Okay. We know, however, that humans impact this cycle um, in one major important way and humans impact that cycle right here, okay? Um, because humans do agriculture, and we do intensive agriculture, um, we use fertilizers, okay? And that fertilizer um, is made of what's called an NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That nitrogen is in the form of nitrate because it's very easily taken up by plants, okay? So we plant plants, we put fertilizer on them. We as human beings tend to overuse fertilizer so that when it rains, that excess fertilizer washes away. Excess fertilizer ends up in a body of water. We know that nitrogen is a limiting factor for plants. So we now get this algae bloom. And we know that this is an algae bloom on steroids. This is cultural eutrophication, meaning it is the process of eutrophication that is exacerbated or accelerated by human action, okay? Eutrophication on its own is a natural process. That's the natural um, algae boom bust cycle reproduces not a lot of resources it dies off resources regenerate process starts again um, with cultural eutrophication there really is no time for those resources to regenerate the algae blooms then you end up getting a drop in the dissolved oxygen that's going to lead to um, dead zones or anoxic zones. And that's gonna lead to your fish kills. Fish are gonna die out because there's no oxygen in the water for them to use. Therefore, they basically smother to death. Um, you could, if this goes on over a long period of time, you could have a decrease in primary productivity um, but that's gonna take a very, very long time for that to occur, okay? Um, is there anything else for the nitrogen cycle that you need to know? Oh, yes, there is. So when we say nitrogen, we talked about it right here, that nitrogen is a limiting factor. What do we mean by that? Like it limits the amount of plant life in an ecosystem. How or why? Because like it can, I, it can only like enter the ecosystem like in specific ways and it's not very prevalent. Like for example, like in like aquatic biomes, it can only enter as runoff. Okay. Your outcome is exactly right. The outcome of being a limiting factor is that growth is dependent upon it. 
it is a limiting factor because it is needed for essential processes or structures for life. And because of that, it's going to limit the amount of growth in a particular area. So in the in its purpose as a limiting factor, nitrogen is used in two major components in an organism that without which the organism would cease to exist. What are those two things? Nucleic acid and amino acids. Uh, go bigger with amino acid. Proteins. There you go. I know I just misspelled nucleic acids. Okay. So it's used for DNA, RNA, right? Because you have those nitrogenous bases. That right there is the nitrogenous base. And then you have the protein. One of the major components of a protein is an amino acid. And it's called an amino acid because one side of it has an amine group, which is a nitrogenous um, side chain. Okay, so those are the pieces and components of the nitrogen cycle that you should be familiar with, okay? You're not gonna see this drawn on a test or this drawn on a test and you have to identify, well, that's an, uh, that's an amino group and that makes it an amino acid. You don't have to do that, you don't have to worry about that. But if you can remember, it creates nucleic acids and proteins that plants and animals need to survive, you can explain why it is an limiting, a limiting factor. All right, questions um, or thoughts, concerns, sorry, I gotta stretch out here, about this particular topic. Okay, um, so I see an additional question in the chat box um, about the zones for marine and freshwater biomes. Um, so the major ones that you should be familiar with um, in terms of zones, like the ones that you're um, mentioning. Uh, so for freshwater, typically we're looking at um, lakes at that point. Okay, so with a lake, you typically have two major pieces that you should be familiar with. And you should be familiar with them because of their um, function, okay? So the shore areas are called the littoral zones. These are the areas that are the most productive um, of the, the lake ecosystem um, because they have the highest amount of photic area, meaning the highest amount of sunlight penetration through the water. Um, and they just have the highest number of plants living there anyway. So the shores are called littoral zones. The largest part or the body of the lake is called the limnetic zone. Okay, and within the limnetic zone, you have, you know, you have your photic zone where sunlight can penetrate and you may have some uh, algae or things like that happening. And then you have um, an aphotic zone, okay? Those are typically the ones to, um, to worry about. Um, the AP exam that I have, that I have seen in the past seven years, I have not seen an AP exam um, be really picky and ask about the profundal zone or the benthic zone of a lake. Doesn't ask for those, so don't panic. Don't worry about those. Um, the only other freshwater biome or ecosystem within that biome um, that really um, gets asked sometimes is about rivers. Um, and we'll get into rivers when we talk more about water usage. Um, but in general, rivers have three major pieces. So river begins at the headwater, 
up in the mountains. And then you're going to get to the deepest, widest part of the river, which is called the floodplain, where it floods. And then you get to um, the mouth of the river, which is where it opens up into another body of water. Um, if this is mixing into the sea or an ocean, this right here is where you're going to have an estuary. Okay. Um, so, place where salt water and fresh water meet. Okay. With marine ecosystems, um, we're looking specifically at the ocean, right? Um, so we have trying to draw this the best way that we can work with it. So in a marine ecosystem, you have, of course, the open ocean. And then you have um, that coastal area. The coastal area that we typically deal with is this intertidal zone. Oop, get back up there. Um, so the intertidal zone is the places between high tide and low tide. Okay. If there is particular or appropriate um, temperatures and appropriate pH of the water, um, you may get in this area right here, you may get some corals growing. So you may get some coral reefs there. The other major pieces to be really familiar with um, are the photic zone or the euphotic zone, same thing. Uh, and this is the portion of the open ocean where sunlight can penetrate in the water. So this is where you're gonna have your photosynthetic um, activity. Most of your producers are gonna live here. And then you have your um, aphotic zone. Aphotic zone means sunlight either cannot reach it or it is very, very diffuse sunlight. So there's gonna be no photosynthesis happening in this area. Um, you're gonna have some of your larger um, predators are gonna live here. They may come up into this photic zone to feed on organisms that are feeding on the, the algae and the plankton and things like that. Um, those are really the major pieces of a marine ecosystem that really get asked about. Um, you may be asked about the abyssal zone, which is the ocean floor. This is where all those crazy weird fish live that like I like to say that they were God science experiments where you get this sucker right here that's got like the big teeth and got that little thing hanging off of its head. The angler fish is what it's called. Um, so you would find those in this abyssal zone very specifically adapted to this area. Um, but in terms of being asked about um, characteristics of or being asked to identify pieces of a marine ecosystem, these are the basic ones. Um, photic, aphotic, intertidal, coral reefs. Those are the largest ones that I've seen asked about on the AP exam continuously, and those are the ones that um, I focus on when I choose questions for your test. Um, as we are looking at this, I would like to ask you, what do coral reef and estuaries have in common? They both involve yeah. salt water. Okay. They have they, the highest primary biodiversity. productivity and biodiversity. Okay. So they have high biodiversity. And in their respective places, they have the highest primary productivity. Okay. Um, so when asked on the test, if you're given an option, if you only see one of these two, you choose that one. If you see these two listed together, you choose both of them. Okay. We choose coral reef if it's both of them. So if it's if you see both of them, 
you're usually given an option to choose both. Oh, okay. So it may be listed like, um, so you may see them listed together as like A is um, open ocean and coral reef. B is coral reef and estuary. C is uh, limnetic and littoral zone. D is headwater and floodplain. Listed together, this is the correct answer. Sometimes you'll see questions that say, uh, ah, limnetic zone. Two, ah, coral reef. Three, headwater. Four, estuary. And the question may be, which of the following um, have the highest net primary productivity? And the answers would be, uh, a would be one only. B might be two only. C might be two and four. And D might be one, two, three, and four. The correct answer would be this one because it identifies both of these. The AP exam does not ask you one or the other in the same question. It usually asks them um, either independently without the other one being listed as an option or you have the option to choose both of them together. Okay. Okay, thank you. You are very welcome. All right, you guys have me for about eight or nine more minutes. Um, are there any other uh, questions any other topics that you would like for me to look at? Uh, anything like that? Um, could you go over primary productivity and how you would like structure like questions for like SAQs or FRQs? Sure can. Um, so primary productivity. Okay. Remember when we talk about this, when we say primary productivity, we are asking about the productivity of primary producers, okay? So producers, we already know, are autotrophs, or they make their own food, which means they are photosynthetic, okay? So when we talk about primary productivity, we are, in the simplest terms, looking at the rate of photosynthesis, okay? How much photosynthesis is being done over how much time in a particular area, okay? We look at primary productivity um, through two mathematical terms. We look at it in terms of gross primary productivity and net primary productivity, okay? Gross, means everything. Net means available for use, okay? Um, you can ask your parents, they have a gross paycheck, which means all of the money they've earned. And then they have a net paycheck, which is how much money they actually get to see after taxes and all of that good stuff is taken out. Um, so gross primary productivity is measured as the sum of net primary productivity plus cellular respiration, okay? So net primary productivity is typically looking at um, photosynthesis that ends up in uh, biomass, okay? So photosynthetic rate that is allowing us to see what is getting produced, okay? So net primary productivity, photosynthesis that ends up in biomass, because remember we're doing photosynthesis to make food to make biomass, plus cellular respiration, okay? Net primary productivity, we can take this formula and figure out what it is. Net primary productivity is equal to gross primary productivity, 
minus the rate of cellular respiration. Okay. So if you're asked on a test to define primary productivity, make sure that you're remembering that it is a rate. It is the change in photosynthetic activity over um, a given amount of time. Uh, sorry, time. Okay. Um, so rate of photosynthesis or the rate at which plants take sunlight energy and convert it into uh, food resources. That would be appropriate as well. Um, you may be asked about understanding the difference between gross primary productivity and net primary productivity. Gross includes cellular respiration. Net takes away cellular respiration. Okay. Um, and then you may be given a question that gives you um, the NPP of two different ecosystems and asks you to interpret or um, infer information about that ecosystem based on the information that you were given. So for example, you may be told that two ecosystems have the same uh, gross primary productivity, but ecosystem one has an NPP of 1,640 kilocalories. And ecosystem two has 2,400 kilocalories. You saw something similar to this on one of your mastery checks, right? Um, so if they start with the same gross primary productivity, okay? They start here, same amount. This right here is gonna be varying, okay? So we look here, net primary productivity is different. Gross primary productivity is the same. So the only thing that could be different is the rate of cellular respiration, okay? So which ecosystem is doing more cellular respiration? Ecosystem one or ecosystem two? Ecosystem two. Doing more cellular respiration? Oh, more cellular respiration is ecosystem one. Ecosystem one. Okay. Because theoretically, let's say that this number is, or this number right here is 5,000, right? So this is the same. We end up with more at the end with ecosystem two, which means it has a lower cellular respiration rate than ecosystem one. Because okay. ecosystem one has less net to work with than two does. Um, and those are the basic things. Um, I have seen in the past um, one or two questions on the AP exam, um, one in multiple choice, and I've seen another one in a free response question um, that asks you to calculate one or the other of these, but it's literally given to you as a plug and play formula. So let's say you're asked to calculate what would the gross primary productivity of this particular ecosystem be given the net primary productivity equals this and the rate of cellular respiration equals this. So you're given two of those three components and you just have to figure out the third through basic um, algebraic manipulation of this formula. Okay. Okay, thank you. You are very welcome. All right, so as we are winding down, um, please do uh, remember this has been recorded. Um, so you can go back and watch pieces uh, that you wanted to review, you wanted to refresh, or if you came in um, after the start time, you can always go back and um, watch it from the beginning. It'll be posted up in Canvas um, a little bit after uh, we finish here. Um, again, just reminders for the test. Uh, make sure that you've got your school Chromebook nice and charged. Um, for AP Classroom, 
you're in class at 920, so you can start the test and have plenty of time. 35 multiple choice questions, two free responses, and that carbon nitrogen diagram. And you should bring your own four function calculator because you can't use the one on your phone or the one on your laptop. Um, this video will be posted if you go to the exact same place where you found this Zoom link. So on the unit one uh, unit review page, um, the Zoom link will be replaced by a link to the recording. Um, and I'll send out a message on Remind letting you know when that video is up and available. Um, don't forget, there is one more review session tomorrow at 6.30. Um, that one will be recorded as well. Um, I will have tutoring before school on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. Um, so you can feel free to stop by then and ask questions as well. Um, and that's it. I'm going to stop recording at this point.